Welcome once again to another episode of The Wall Behind and Beyond. I am your host, Philip A. Jones. As always, we bring you personal perspectives from those who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. It is a part of our focus and mission to tell the stories which shape the lives of everyday people in hopes that someone listening will take away something that will help them in their own lives. Today, our guest is an award-winning author and lyricist. She is also the program director of the Jackie Song Foundation, a community-based organization that helps bring equity and opportunity to underserved people in the Virginia area. The foundation's primary focuses are after-school care, music lessons for children, and reentry programs for citizens returning from incarceration. We welcome to the show none other than Ms. Nisa Hart. How are you today, and thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm doing well. I hope you are, too. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to just take it right away because we've been dying to hear, you know, about your organization. But my first question for you is, can you tell our listeners where you are from and a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, I was born and raised in Virginia. Uh, I have lived here all of my life within a hundred mile radius. Um, I have my degree and expertise from the University of Mary Washington, which is local to my area here. And I have been in the nonprofit industry since 1980 when I graduated from college in 89 and have been doing that ever since. Excellent, excellent. Can you tell us about Jackie's Song Foundation and what made you start it? Sure. Um, my aunt, Jackie, uh, who was a missionary, um, died from complications of breast cancer in 2000. And she had saved aggressively for her retirement and asked us at the time of her death to use her annuity in order to start a foundation that would work with children, particularly in the area of music education. So we did that. We founded the nonprofit named after her, and we have been involved in music education to underserved populations since we achieved our nonprofit status in 2004. That's a beautiful and inspirational story. It is the stuff that lets us know that earth angels really do exist. I dare anybody not to be touched right now. You're shaping your aunt's legacy, living out your aunt's dream, and touching lives for it, like it sounds like she would have done. To give somebody the gift of being able to express themselves through music is a gift seldom encountered. Bravo. I see that your organization has several focuses. What made you add the reentry program in 2016 geared toward returning citizens from incarceration? Sure. Um, we One of the things that we have done almost from the beginning is we offer an after-school music program for kids who are in underserved areas, and we work closely with local social services, uh, school guidance counselors to identify students, and we started a program in 2011 where we started servicing children of incarcerated parents. Um, as you know, that's such an economic strain on a family when a parent is incarcerated. So we provide free or deeply scholarship opportunities to children of incarcerated parents. And in working with them, uh, as parents would re-enter, we began to discover some of the complications and obstacles to re -enter entry programs and re-entry success uh, for the parents of our students, and that's how we began to be involved in that. I think it's a shame society isn't focusing on this the way that you are, because the data clearly states that when children have parents who are absent due to incarceration, they are predisposed to developmental issues that affect the way they show up in the world, and this is unfortunate. Yeah, that's exactly it, is that we, we soon learned that part of the cycle of recidivism and part of the cycle of generational incarceration has to do with obstacles that incarcerated individuals experience in trying to be rehabilitated, in trying to reenter society, in trying to be active and involved parents. There are so many things in the way of that happening that not only does that lead to recidivism issues, but it leads to generational issues where as children come along and they become teens and then there's an absentee father or there's an economic stress because of an, an absent mother or whatever the situation may be, then they end up as part of the system too. And so that's how we began to wade into those waters was as we saw needs for our students, we were able to assist with parents in reuniting families and making situations better for the kids that we serve. What do you feel a reentry program should consist of? 
and how do we get lawmakers to see the need for us to focus on making sure these services are available? Yeah, I think that where the real gaps are, um, in many places, uh, we have a, a jail and not a prison here locally, and they offer absolutely nothing in terms of job training. They, there's no skills. It, it strictly is a holding place. Um, of course, job skills are important. And I think really the most important thing is for before an inmate exits the facility to have at his or her disposal all of the resources that are available to them to find housing, to find employment, to find transportation, to find uh, assistance with food needs, health needs, all of those things rather than just handing them a bus pass and turning them out on the sidewalk and expecting them to survive. So there, there's not enough transitional assistance to help someone who walks out of the door at 7.30 on a Tuesday morning and they're given a one-way bus ticket and they're expected to check in at probation within three days or parole within three days and there's nothing else to assist them. And that's, that's a whole lot to tackle on your own without any money in your pocket without any assistance from family, that's more than most people can overcome. And one of the main things that we are trying to do um, in a class that I help facilitate release readiness is we're trying to cover all bases and provide every single need of an individual who is on their way out before they even get released. So that way they don't have a lack uh, because it's that lack. It could be one thing. Uh, that sets the person back. And so it sounds like you you guys are covering that also in your ideology of what uh, a reentry program should consist of. Because we're talking about employment before you get there, training uh, for that employment before you get there, housing already, funds available, uh, resources so that he, you can have transportation, all of the above. Because if one thing is missing, that could be enough right there to set a person off their course uh, and they may end up back inside. So I'm, I appreciate what you guys are doing. That is the that is the key. Yeah, well, and that's it. And and we have some assistance available in our area in various places, but nothing is united under one umbrella. So we have a homelessness coalition that will help with housing. We have an organization that will help with job training, and they have several contracts with different companies to do everything from. Um, barber skills to traffic control. So we have those things available in our area, but there's nobody who pulls all that under one tent and says, this is what you need to be successful. If you need assistance with food, here's where you call. If you need assistance with a job, here's companies you can talk to. No one does that. So it becomes a real barrier when you start to think about the fact that in many cases, um, they don't even have a cell phone. So they're completely dependent upon the library for internet access, or if they do have a cell phone, they're, they're dependent upon a data plan, which may or not be sufficient for doing any kind of complicated web search. And then when you add to that, in some cases, there are language barriers, there are literacy barriers, and they need really just someone to walk them through the options. So what problem are you having? How can I assist you in finding the solution to that problem? And that's primarily really what we do. We don't so much intervene with direct assistance as we intervene with, here are your options for solving this problem. And here is who is able to assist you in the area that we live in. That is so good. And, um, you know, you find a lot of reentry organizations and programs across the country. And we're still seeing the recidivism rates uh, soar at 60%. Uh, and it would be so great if we could bring them down to at least 20 or even lower. But uh, you guys seem like you have it all under control, and you guys are really doing great things, and I'm really proud of that. So I wanted to ask you another question. Um, having returning citizens come back to a society shackled with debt and the inability to get a driver's license seems to be an obvious impediment for them considering how hard it is for those who have not been to prison. Uh, do you believe returning citizens need a, a clean slate? So to speak, you know, we're we live in a time where fortunately some ideas and expectations and biases in our society are changing. Uh, it is easier for a person to overcome the challenge of a felony background, certainly a misdemeanor background, but even a felony background uh, to gain employment, uh, to gain social services than it has ever been before. Um, it still is not easy, but it is not as hard as it was even a decade ago. Um, laws are changing. The Criminal Reform Act helped a lot with that. Um, we've had laws change in Virginia. Other states are addressing issues. So I don't necessarily think it's necessary to have a clean slate, but I do think that 
it, it costs money to get a job. It costs money to get a driver's license. It costs money to get housing. It costs money to get job training. None of those things are free. So there definitely is a need for a returning citizen to be plugged in to organizations, social programs, uh, churches, uh, you know, other nonprofit organizations that can assist with those basic skills. So there are lots of people who have professional clothing available, and that's everything from work boots, jeans, and a flannel shirt to a business suit. Um, there are lots of organizations that have food pantries available. There are lots of organizations that assist with temporary or even permanent housing place. But you have to be able to find those things. And you, more importantly, have to be able to communicate with those organizations. And in many cases here in Virginia, a lot of that requires filing a petition with the court, going before a judge, talking to the judge about what your need is to get your driver's license reinstated or to overcome uh, a housing deposit. And you just have to have help with that because it's not a skill everyone has. I like that. And I guess what I mean by clean slate is they should have some type of debt forgiveness. You cannot pay your debt straight out of prison unless you're already rich. And uh, the majority of people that are incarcerated don't have um, that that kind of uh, resource. So uh, I was talking in terms of, you know, wh why not have a debt forgiveness? I mean, you put a person in a position, they can't pay it anyway. And so yeah. what's going to happen? There's a penalty on that. So that's what I was speaking of. They should just forgive it all. Get a person the opportunity to go out there, get a job, get employed, and then from there, take care of their responsibilities, you know? Yeah, well, and I think there's no question that, that they need a way to overcome the financial obstacles, even if that's just, can we put a temporary stay on child support payments? Can we put a temporary stay on uh, court debt? You know, in, in Virginia, we have a new law that allows an inmate to, or a returning citizen to pay off court debt um, by doing voluntary public service. And that's one of the things that we provide is we're a nonprofit and we provide volunteer hours and available opportunities so that you can work off a of court debt uh, instead of having to come up with $680 to get your driver's license back. Um, so they definitely, there's no question that the financial obstacle is much larger than people realize that it is. And that they do need assistance in overcoming that financial obstacle, even if it's just a three-month stay that allows them to get their feet under them and then to begin to repay a debt. Because none of those things are free. Oh, wow. I mean, it's just so much to unpack, you know. And then where do you start? Because I think that after all these years of doing criminal justice, uh, we should understand the basics of what it takes uh, for one to come home and be successful. And you cannot straddle a bunch of burden on top of a person and expect them to be able to function um, properly after being inside for so long, or even not for so long, and for any amount of time that you lose ground. My next question is the reason that we even reached out. Um, it is very important you that have I one minute left. that we'll pick back up on the other side. Thank you all for listening, subscribing, and sharing my podcast. Here are three ways to help me today. Consider donating, if you can, to my GoFundMe for my freedom efforts. You can find that by typing in Incarcerated Lives Matter, Philip Alvin Jones on GoFundMe. Subscribe today to my YouTube channel, The Wall Behind and Beyond. Comment and share. We are on our journey to a 1,000 subscribers. We can do this. Visit GrantParoleToPhilip.com. It's a one-stop shop that has my direct contact info and awesome social media sites. Please get in touch with us if you'd like to help in any way with Team Phillip. Thank you, and keep listening to The Wall, Behind and Beyond. We're having a powerful uh, discussion. My neighbor, who has been incarcerated for over 40 years, saw you on a TV show with Courtney Hansen, um, Ride of Your Life, and he suggested that I reach out to you because he knows I do a podcast. Uh, he wanted you to be on. Uh, he wanted to know if your organization could help someone in his situation who has made parole several different times, but for whatever reason they keep telling him he needs a sponsor to get released, there's no reason he should not be released. Here is Gary in his own words. I challenge anybody not to be moved by this man's testimony. Yeah, this is Gary Williams. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I've, I've been incarcerated over 40-plus years, continuously, never never been out. Under parole consideration, uh, uh, again, at, at, at this time, I got granted parole 
last in 2016, and my wife was undergoing cancer treatment, surgery, you know, the chemo and uh, radiation, and my CCO that I was assigned wouldn't approve the release address, basically saying that he didn't believe she'd be a viable sponsor with her health, and he put that she was terminal, and she wasn't terminal. Fast forwarding, my wife went to her uh, oncologist and got a new letter and took it to the uh, CCO office saying, you know, she was stage two at, at that time. And uh, the supervisor's office still wouldn't override the CCO, so I stayed in parole status, still incarcerated for a year. October 5th of this year, then she passed. We have been an uh, integral part of each other's life for 45 years, married for 31. So that was about a lot. So, you know, now that she's passed, it makes it even more difficult for me to have any type of release plan or, or so forth. So my question is, is there anything that your organization could do in terms of this gentleman, my neighbor? What do we need to address, and how could this be something that we could bring uh, to their attention? Yeah, I, I thought about that. It's California, right? Isn't it California that he lives in? We're in Washington State, but his case is in Alabama, actually. Alabama, okay. So I, I thought about that, um, and we don't have national resources, but what I would point you toward is, first, you should reach out to Prison Fellowship because they have a whole national network of organizations that assist with reentry that are very involved with everything from legislatures to courts to social programs. And so Prison Fellowship is a really good resource for that. Um, and also, he should write, calling is better, but if he doesn't have the capacity or the ability to do that, writing a letter works. He should write his delegate, so his uh, member of the House of Delegates uh, in Alabama, explaining the situation and ask them to get involved. They will do that with constituent services. Um, and so what it sounds like to me is that there's a red tape issue and that red tape issue can be overcome um, either by an organization that's accustomed to that, like Prison Fellowship, or through a delegate's office who has the contacts to be able to do that. So those, I think, are the best bets for him in terms of immediate assistance. Um, your prison fellowship representative should be, you should be available to find them there where you are. Um, if not, it's a, it's a web search away, and I'm sure Erica or someone could provide you with that resource. For sure. Thank you so much. I'm definitely going to get that information to him, um, and hopefully that works, and hopefully um, he can get up out of here because he's getting elderly and uh, his health is not too good. Um, so let's just pray that uh, something works for this uh, gentleman. And thank you for your uh, advice. Uh, what projects or initiatives are you working on currently? And what would you like to see change in the current system? Um, the, the biggest things that we work on is we provide volunteers who have the literacy skills and the knowledge and the experience to be able to walk returning citizens through some of the legal and financial obstacles. Um, that I think is where the system is falling short. Um, the, the changes to laws have made it easier for former inmates, for felons to find employment. You know, a simple Google search tells you that there's 20 national corporations, General Electric, uh, Dave's Killer Bread, McDonald's, PetSmart, who have programs where they actively seek out and hire uh, people with felony records. So it's easier to get a job. It's easier to overcome things like holds on driver's license, but there's not an organization that assists with specifically the literacy and knowledge and information resources that you need to be successful. So that's where, you know, we do that in our little corner of the world, but where I really would like to see moving forward organizations who have resources to do that on a much broader scale. And that's so powerful that you said that. Uh, it's so awesome because that's one of the things in our nonprofit that we have been trying to focus on. There's so many corporations and sports franchises and, that have a criminal justice platform, social justice platform, and a lot of times they're not close to the problem. So we're coming closer uh, to a way to bring it all together, and it'll be much more smoothly uh, put out there for us to utilize. So thank you so much. I think that you guys are doing 
an awesome thing over there. Oh, absolutely. And that's, you know, we, we just find that the more we can do to assist people in being rehabilitated, which is their goal, as well as what's supposed to be the system's goal, it helps our community, it helps our students, it helps them. It just makes all the way around a bad situation into a better situation. For sure. What would you like our listeners to take away from this discussion? I think the main thing is, is if you're in a situation where you are able to help, one of the, the best things you can do is spend time collecting resources. So use search engines, talk to social workers, talk even to public defenders who know a lot of things that are available, talk to probation officers, um, find out what resources are available to returning citizens, have that in one easy to find packet that you can just make available to people as they need. And I think the other thing is, is if you're a returning citizen, know that those things are available, know that you may have to seek out various people to help you find them, but you can overcome those barriers. And you just, if you know ahead of time what those barriers are and you have a plan coming out the door that you need to find solutions to those obstacles, you're gonna be way ahead of the game than if you come out of the door and you don't even know what you're facing. For sure. And this goes for family as well as um, those close to uh, incarcerated individuals who are returning citizens. Um, gather your resources. Yes. Um, maybe we need to put together a how-to uh, book. There's probably some out there. Look for those because the same uh, barriers that stand before returning citizens over and over again, and um, we have to figure out a way to uh, have a, a connected uh, set of circumstances for people to have um, answers uh, to some of these questions and problems that they face so that that way they don't run against the wall and um, it goes bad for them. So appreciate what you're doing. And um, any final words that you have? You know, the most helpful thing that anyone said to me when my family and my personal experience first entered the whole world of criminal prosecution and incarceration and all of those things was my mother made the statement to me that sooner or later, it's going to be over and it will be over sooner rather than later. And I was able to hold on to that and to recognize that this is a lot to get through. It's a lot to understand. It's a lot to digest, but there are paths moving forward and more of my life is left on the other side than is on this side. And so we just need to continue to encourage citizens that they can re-enter and they can be productive and they can have a whole life and they can have a happy life. And 95% of the challenge of that is having a plan. If you have a plan, you're able to work the plan and make adjustments as you go, as opposed to just walking out the door and trying to make it up as you go along. Well, they say, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So, so definitely planning is key. Um, and mm -hmm. something else that you said, uh, it really hit home. Our reason for doing what we do is to raise awareness, but also to try to give out solution um, to some of the problems that various people face. And so with each mm -hmm. of us coming together and sharing our personal experiences, we can learn lessons from each other. And so this is why we like having people come on, such as yourself, um, who is out there and who is really in the field uh, trying to make a difference. Uh, so we really appreciate you, and we want you to continue and be successful in the work that you're doing. Thanks a lot for everything that you're doing. Absolutely. It's it's our pleasure, and it's it's our reward to be able to see people begin to put their lives together and to move forward in our community and in our culture. How can people or other organizations get a hold of you or assist you with funding or, su or support in the areas of the work that you're doing? Sure. Um, our website is Stafford Handbells. That's S-T-A-F-F-O-R-D, handbells, um, just like the instrument, uh, .org. Um, they can find us there. Um, also .com. It works both ways. And my email is staffordhandbells at gmail.com. And either one of those ways will reach me for information or to learn about our organization and what we do. Um, and anyone can reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to share whatever knowledge I have. That's what's up. Thank you so much, Lisa, for coming on. Reach out, everybody. Check out the website, Jackie Song Foundation. 
and see how you can get involved or see what you can learn about the system that you can use for your returning citizens. Thank you, Nisa, for your services and your work. We appreciate all that you are doing. You are welcome. Have a great afternoon. You too. As always, I want to give a special thanks to our listeners for your continued support of The Wall Behind and Beyond. And if you haven't already, I ask that you go and subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Wall Behind and Beyond. We want to be able to notify you every week when a new episode drops so you get exclusive access. Also, share the episode that you like with friends and post our links on your socials. You guys are the show. And as we grow... We will bring you more quality content. Remember, I am because we are. If you want to get a hold of me direct, I can be reached via email at www.jpay.com, 881-507, Washington State. Take care, everyone, and be well.